Okay, I guess let's get started. Um, so welcome back. So today's lecture is going to be on asymmetric numeral systems. Uh, so let's just uh, go over the quiz from last time. So last time we learned about arithmetic coding and the quiz question was again around a Bernoulli random variable, uh, which we have been now seeing quite a lot where probability of A is P and probability of B is just one minus P. And you were asked to consider two symbols, A, B and B, A, both of them to be encoded using arithmetic coding, right? Um, and the first part was, do the code words for A, B and B, A have the same code length? Um, yeah, okay, I see a couple of nodding heads and that's indeed correct. Uh, I think most of you got this right. Uh, in our case, both probability of a, b is going to be p times 1 minus p, which is same as probability of b, a, just, just if you want to write it, right, exact. And as Shubham discussed in last lecture, the code word length just depends on the interval length, which depends on the probability. So in this case, both of them will have the exact same code word length. And then the follow-up question was like, does our arithmetic coder output the same code word? Yeah. Uh, on 1.1, 1 .1, minor point is the upper bound of the code length depends on the probabilities. Yeah. In practice, for a real arithmetic coder, the code lengths might, might be different by up to two bits. Uh, so that's why in the question, I think we added a statement that you have to assume an idealized version yep. of the arithmetic coder, otherwise it's not actually strictly two uh, Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good point. Uh, is that clear? Uh, so what Shubham just said is like in the actual, if if you remember, like the code word length actually uh, was so this was like the bound for our code word length, and so you you'd actually need an idealized. Uh, compressor which can which can do this and in this particular case you can work out the exact probabilities right okay um, yeah continuing the second part was like do they output the same code word and the answer there is uh, obviously false they are both like if we look at the zero one line interval um, a b and b a would go for like the different regions sorry let me just explain Right, so your B A would be in this region, whereas your A B would be expanded out in this particular region, right? And so they are just different code words. Okay. Quite straightforward. Uh, any doubts on that one? No. Okay. So continuing on the second part, uh, so then we basically uh, gave you some some probability distribution over symbols. Um, and gave the probabilities and then given an input bit stream and an input of len 3, we ask like what's the decoded sequence. So it's a very standard arithmetic decoding. You guys just had to go back and redo what we learned in the class. So in this case, I've already converted this bit stream corresponds to 0 0.6, uh, 09375. And so all you need to do is repeat, um, sorry, um, repeat the decoding procedure, right? So our A, A contains 0.5 mass, B contains 0.25, and similarly C contains 0.25, and your number is somewhere here, right? So the first symbol you will output is B, okay? And then you zoom in and you repeat again divided into four, three intervals and find the point and if you keep doing that you basically get the BAC as your uh, output code word. Yeah. Okay, any questions on arithmetic coding before we get started with ANS? Cool. Um, before we start I just want to give uh, Kedar a shout out. Mostly most of these slides are similar from the last year and so I um, just wanted to give him credit. Okay. So last class we learned about arithmetic coding and there we learned about that uh, given any distribution P, your arithmetic coder achieves optimal compression. 
And one really important point there was like what arithmetic coding allows is to separate the model and entropy coding part. So you can come up with a best model for whatever distributed, distributed um, for whatever system you have, right? You can come up with the probability for the, those blocks. And then the entropy coding part takes care of ensuring that the lens basically have this bound, which we, which we just looked at, right? Like in the class. So basically allows you to come up with a good model separately and then just use the code as is. Okay, which was not something we were able to do in Huffman or uh, Shannon or any of the previous codes which we looked at. Um, this also meant that it can work very well with changing distribution P. In, in fact, you can come up with like adaptive algorithms which adapt to your changing data distribution uh, using arithmetic coding. And that's going to be a topic which we'll learn and um, which we'll get to, I think, in two lectures from now. We'll show some uh, concrete examples there. Um, and yeah, we had like, there are various variants of arithmetic coding in practice, which you will find mostly depends on how we break down the ties, uh, how, how we basically impl have an impl efficient implementation of the encoder and decoder. Um, and basically arithmetic coders are used like everywhere, right? Like, so again, we'll, we'll see more and more examples of this in future lectures. But then what's the issue, right? Like, so uh, these were discovered sometime back in 1970s. Um, so are we done? Like, like is, is lossless compression a solved problem? Interestingly, no. So again, I think Shubham talked about it in the last lecture. But if you look at the compression, so this is bits per symbol, lower is better. Uh, arithmetic coding does much better than Huffman coding. Again, it was because like you can imagine the whole block length, uh, whole data is part of the block length, right? But interestingly, when you compare the speed of arithmetic and Huffman, like both the encode speed is lower as well as the decode speed is lower and actually quite lower, right? And dependent on the application, you might actually want to trade off the compression you can get with the speed because you might just have to deal with a lot of data very fast. Um, and these numbers are from um, Charles Bloom's blog, which is like very, um, very interesting. Um, and so today we'll learn about RANS and TANS. And if you look at the compression for RANS and TANS, they have basically the same similar compression performance, uh, but they have much higher, uh, at least decompression speed. Like we'll come to the encode speed, but if you look at the decompression speed, they have like much higher uh, of magnitude, right? So if you were to compare something like TANS and Huffman, they basically have very similar decode speed. Uh, TNS has very much higher encode speed than arithmetic, while it performs almost similarly, though with some slight overhead compared to arithmetic in this particular example. And this is the reason why uh, we want to even study these codes, right? These are like really efficient. Um, and basically, like, so these were discovered, I think, around 2014. And if you look at any compressors today, uh, they basically use uh, a lot of practical compressors today use some version of uh, ANS. So ANS is basically a class. Uh, it's, it's a class of compressors. It's not really a single compressor. And for example, RANS is one version, TANS, R stands for range, T stands for table. These are like two extremes of this family of compressors. Uh, but there are like various variants of ANS out there. And basically they have replaced uh, arithmetic coding and Huffman coding in various places depending on the application requirement. So for example, RANS is basically just a drop in re replacement for arithmetic, but it's going to be faster. So if you care about the compression performance, you might want to do this while getting advantages over the speed. Similarly, TANS is actually a drop in replacement for Huffman. Uh, but now in its case, like it's almost as fast as Huffman but it gets much better compression, right? So it's like, depending on your application, these, these algorithms are a direct clear win to be like, they have the best properties of Huffman or arithmetic. Okay, so now that we understand like these, there is something missing in, in, in the kind of uh, code, um, in kind of encoding strategies which we have learned and there exists something, let's try to understand it a little better, like how it works, right? And so this has a very funky name. It's called asymmetric numeral system, uh, which in itself is a good question. Like, why do you call it asymmetric numeral system? Uh, but 
even before we start with a symmetric numeral system, let's start with a symmetric numeral system example, uh, which actually all of us have seen in real life, right? So suppose you have inputs as digits, just single digits, zero to nine. Um, and let's say you want to encode this, right? So some, some data stream, which is, which comes from the alphabet zero to nine. So let's say your data input is three, two, four, one, five. Okay. Um, can you form a single number X, which represents this data input? I heard a yeah, sorry. Yeah. How would you do that? Like, how, how would you represent, like, if you knew these were, like, just digits, how would you represent this as a single state and tell your friend? You would use this, so the uh, student answer, you would use it as a digit of one number. Exactly. You can, you can encode this as just three, two, four, one, five. Right? And if you think about what this three, two, four, one, five really is, like, what was the encoding operation you did? Can somebody answer that? Sorry? Yeah, so the answer was like use, use like the base 10, which is exactly the idea here. Like you will use base 10, but now you, you have to think about your data will be input as a stream, right? Like, so we are looking into a streaming kind of code, right? So you would start with three. Uh, but exactly like you said, we'll, we'll see how we can form this. So let's say you start with three. So that, if that was the only thing, you would just represent it as three. Now let's say you receive the second symbol three comma two. Okay. So the way you would do this is just multiply it with 10, add two. That's 32. That's exactly the decimal 10 expansion of this thing. Right. Now let's say the third symbol you receive is four. Right. So one way to think of it is again like decimal expansion, right? Three times hundred, two times 10 plus four. But you could have also thought of this as just 32 multiplied by 10 plus four, right? And does this give you an idea of basically forming like a streaming encoder for, for this thing? Right. So the idea is very simple. At each point, you maintain some initial state. That's the only thing you are maintaining. Okay. Uh, when you receive the first input three, you just multiply the previous state by 10 and add the new input, right? That's, that's the only thing we were doing. That's the decimal expansion of, so as to say this thing. And you keep updating your state. So when you receive three, your next state is three. After you receive two, it's 32. And so on and so forth. So 320 plus four, three to four, zero plus one. And you keep doing that to get the final state, three to four, one, five. Okay. Now suppose your friend comes to you and gives you this state and ask you, like, uh, what was the symbols which were encoding, encoded? Can you do that? This is exactly the next question. Exactly. So the solution which uh, gave was, uh, I can start, I'll start with this, uh, sorry, three, two, one, four, five. As my initial state, I'll divide it by 10 and calculate the modulus operand, operand right? And this will give me, oh, sorry. This will give me three, two, one, four, and five, right? And then I can keep repeating this op operation. So in this particular case, the by 10 operation gives you the previous state, right? So this was the previous state from which you got your new state. And the modulus operander gives you the symbol. But now you see something interesting. When you do that, you will actually get five first, right? Then four, then one, then two, then three. So, uh, basically, your decoding runs in exactly the same fashion, like we just talked about. Oh, sorry. Okay. Your decoding runs in the exact same fa fashion we just talked about. So, you just do 
modular 10 sorry uh, you just find the integer part as well as the remainder and you keep reco recovering back the state which you had and the symbol which was encoded the last so when you start with 3 2 1 4 5 you'll first get a uh, symbol as 5 and the previous state as 3 2 1 4 again you divide this by 10 3 2 1 4 you continue this right and you know where to stop because either you were told the number of symbol or you get back to some initial state where you started from. So the encoding process started from s equals to zero. You recover that and you can stop that. Okay, I got back to my initial state. Okay, nice. So now if we were to write it as a decoding step and an encoding step, uh, what did we do? We actually did nothing, right? Like, so you are maintaining a state which you are going to output. Sorry. Yeah. You are maintaining a state which you are going to output. Whenever you encode a symbol, you multiplied the previous state by 10 and then you added the symbol. Okay. During decoding, you start with some state x. You decode the symbol by first taking the modulo operanda, right? And then you update the state by just dividing it by taking the integer part by 10 right and then your decode step kind of needs to return both the uh, symbol as well as the state so that you can continue this step nice and like we said in this procedure uh, the the symbols which you get are in opposite order right so when you encode it you went from encoding 3 to 2 to 1 to 4 to 5 but when you are decoding you are coming in opposite order Okay. And in each step, you are able to recover the exact same state, which were used during the encoding, right? So when you went from encoding, you went from, like, if you just look at the state, you went from 0 to 3 to 32 to 3 to 14 to 3 to 145. But the decoding was a reverse process. You started with 3 to 145 and each step you recovered the same state. Is it clear? Okay. So, so far, very simple, right? Like very simple idea. All of us have, have used this <laughs> in, in some fashion, one way or the other. Uh, so this is exactly like the symmetric numeral system encoder. Okay. Uh, there is one last piece missing. Like we never converted our things to any bit arrays, right? Like we just left it at this number, this state to be encoded. Uh, so the last step is basically just transmitting the final state X in binary using uh, something like C law of log 2 x plus 1 bits and like similar idea as what uh, uh, Shubham discussed last time. And so if you now look at the complete encoding step, right? So remember this was our base encoding step, which was just multiplying by 10 and uh, adding the symbol. And then if you have a data input, which you want to encode, you'll start with some initial state, which was zero in our case, like when we started. And then for each symbol in data input, you just encode your symbol and you update your state, okay? And finally, you just output the uh, binary binary uh, form of whatever your state is. So at this point, we have a complete encoder, right? Like it gives you a bit stream out and you can losslessly use to recover the original bit stream. And then when you are decoding, you are just reversing the each step, right? Like encoder and decoder are exact reverse of each other. So the decode step, first of all, you are converted into some uint from the bits, right? So that you get your final state. And then again, you have your symbols and for all your symbols, you'll do this decode step over the state, returning you a symbol and state. And you will append the symbols in a list and you'll keep doing that, right? It's, it's occurring in a streaming fashion. Finally, the thing which you need to be careful about is you need to reverse the symbols. Otherwise, the order of symbols in which you are returning things would be wrong. Okay. And now, in this case, we have an encoder and a decoder which are exactly mirror image of each other. You can ensure that it, they will always do lossless uh, encoding, decoding, right? Okay. So we have a lossless compressor. Hmm. Okay, even before we go there, um, even before we go to the next slide, um, any ideas about like what kind of compression rates is this compressor able to achieve? So 
So as a hint, let's just look at the encoding step, right? What are you doing? So your, your symbols are always in Your symbols are always one of zero, one, two, whatever, nine. But what about X? As you keep encoding more and more and more and more symbols, what's happening to X? It's, it's, it's very simple, no, no tricks. It keeps on growing. It keeps on growing uh, by how much? Exactly. So now what you are doing is your state is going to 10 times state X at each step approximately. And your state is continuously growing. So this number X is always after a point, it's always going to start dominating S. Right? So roughly, roughly at for each symbol, the price you are paying is to encode a number which is 10 times the previous number. And so you are paying roughly log two to the base 10 extra bits per symbol. Now this only happens once you have encoded a few of them, like the first few symbols, this won't be true, but you'll reach that stage very fast because your symbol is just limited in zero to 10. Whereas remember in our example, your state keeps on, just keeps on growing, right? And this is exactly the idea. So at each step, your state X is just becoming 10 times the previous. And so roughly per symbol, you are paying these many extra bits. Correct. And so in this particular case, our compressor actually is an optimal compressor for symbols, which are in zero to nine. If we assume that the symbols were uniformly distributed. Because no matter what, what the symbol is, you are paying roughly log to a uh, log 10 to the base two extra bits to encode it, which will be the entropy in this particular case. Great. So in some sense, we have already, uh, we have found a very nice compressor, uh, which works well for uniformly distributed symbols, right? You can think of how you can generalize it from 10 to something else. Like it need not be just zero to nine. Any other numeral system would do for you, right? Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's good. But this compressor is only optimal, uh, if you have basically each of these symbols have probability. Point one, right? It's uniformly distributed. Does anyone have any guesses what we can do? Uh, if let's say this was a non-uniform distribution. Yeah. A a any guesses? Why, why was this optimal? Let's, let's just see this again, right? Let's leave it here. So it was optimal because my state was being multiplied by 10 at each step for each symbol, no matter what the symbol was. Like why 10? Why does, what does this imply? So another way to think about this, right is the extra price I am paying at each step was this. And so far in the class over almost every class we have talked about, this is like one thumb rule you live by. Like if you can, if you can get a compressor, which gives you lens around lock to one by P you have, you have done the job. That's, that's like the best thing you can do with this compressor, right? So now with, with this thing in mind, can, can somebody take a guess? Like wh what would you do if, if these symbols were, I don't know, um, coming from with like zero was coming with probability zero, uh, P zero, uh, one was coming with probability P one, so on and so forth. Yeah, 
that's a that's a good guess so the guess which was said here was like okay maybe we want to multiply by a smaller number but why smaller why not bigger let's start with i yes i do want you to multiply by something else but what was this 10 really right again it was it was it's not arbitrary it's actually the value of log of 1 over p oh uh, sorry it, it's value of 1 over p right so what you would want to do for when you have different probabilities really is somehow multiply have some equation which can give you maybe something like this right And if you can do that, then roughly whenever you get a symbol PS, we'll, we'll discuss the details how exactly to do that. But let's see if we understand the idea. And if you can do that, then no matter what symbol PS, when it, when it gets encoded, you end up paying an extra price of just log of one by PS approximately, right? Which is the best thing you can do. Is everyone with me? Like if we, if we understand this, we have, we have at least understood the basic idea of uh, the asymmetric numeral system and what we are trying to design, why it might work. So again, instead of scaling X as 10 times X previous, we want to scale it as something like one over probability of S at each step. Okay. Is everyone with me? Cool. So now let's, let's see how exactly RANS does this. And to do that, let's introduce some, some notations, which, which will be useful. Um, so we'll consider probabilities, which can be written in terms of integer frequencies. Okay. What that means is like, if you have a probability, you can write it as frequency S by some integer M. Uh, Let's take an example, just to be clear. So let's say you have alphabet, which is 0, 1, 2, and your probabilities, which are 3 by 8, 3 by 8, 2 by 8. Okay. In this case, I'll represent this as a, a set, a list of frequencies, which is 3, 3, 2, which is just, um, which is just taking the, taking the top terms here, right? And M, which is the common denominator, 8. Okay. And we'll also deter, we'll also, uh, as we have seen, I think even in arithmetic coding and before, uh, something which is really nice is an object to keep track of is the cumulative, cumulative probability distribution. And we'll keep track of something parallel of that here. So we'll keep track of the cumulative, cumulative frequencies essentially. Okay. So the cumulative frequencies in our case is like, so, Frequencies are for A3, B3, C2, and so a cumulative frequency array. Is that visible? Yeah, okay. You'll start from zero plus you'll add the previous one, three, plus you'll add the previous one, six. So just summing the frequencies up till that point. So this object will be, will be useful as well. And so this is, ex so in code terms, somebody was like, they were not able to think, how do I, how do I write it in code terms, right? Like, okay, I understand approximately I need to multiply it by one by probability S. Yes. Okay. But as we were seeing in symmetrical numeral system, right? We'll, we'll, why do I keep okay. we'll, <laughs> we'll, re, uh, we'll basically do the exact same steps. So if you look at the encode step, it's going to be the exactly same. You start with some initial state. For each symbol in data input, you run this base encode step, which we are calling, which takes in the previous state and the symbol and updates the state. And finally, you are going to return the binary form of this. Right? And so the only thing which has changed is this base encode step, which was previously. So previously, what was this? So previously, it was just 10 times x plus s return x, right? Now we need to update this thing. 
so given this notation any any ideas what what we can do to to get this It's it's not that hard, yeah. Go for it. Uh, well, we could take the ceiling of one of the probability s and, and then just apply the hint, but I'm not sure how you would make it like that. So. Perfect. So the the answer was we can we can maybe take the ceiling of f s over m instead of probability s, um, but we are not sure how do we decode that. That's that's a great point, and we'll come to that. Uh, but this is the base encode step in case of RANS. And what I want you guys to, so this is, I'm giving it to you. I'm not right now justifying all parts of it. But if you look at the part, which is just focusing on the X previous one, what we are doing is, is we are taking like the modulo, sorry, not modulo, the integer division with frequency S and then multiplied by M. Exactly what the student suggestion was, right? Like I, I need to divide it by probability. Let me take a, let, let me take the integer division by fs and then multiply it by m. Okay. And then we add a bunch of other stuff, which we'll discuss in one second. Okay. But basically here, now you have ensured your state roughly increases by one over ps at each, whenever the symbol s is being encoded, right? Yeah, and so let's let's just focus on this step now. Um, let's just see. Let, let's let's work it out together for for a few examples so that we really understand what just happened. So this again, I'm I'm repeating because like I like to remember it, uh, like this base step. It's always good to go back to the symmetric numeral system to see how this is coming from, right? So previously it was x previous times ten plus symbol. And so now this 10 part, let's take this 10 part is being replaced by something like this. And this plus symbol part has been replaced by something like this. Okay. Right. Let's, let's just work out some examples and then we'll see if it, if it makes sense how we can use this to decode. Right. Uh, so, so let's work out the example for uh, this particular setting where let's say you had the alphabets which we have been discussing, 0, 1, 2. And then your frequencies were 3, 3, 2, m is 8, cumulative probabilities is this. And so let's try to work out the final encoding for 1, 0, 2, 1. Okay, so let's start. So your initial state, let me just say, um, yeah, okay, let's just do it. So your initial state is 0, okay? At next step, you want to encode input 1, okay? So your, let me use the same symbols which are used here. So your initial state X is zero, S is symbol, X, X is the state. Uh, so in the first step, let's just, when you are trying to encode one, so now you get symbol one. And so let's just work out the new state. So new state is going to be X previous by frequency S, just just three in this case, times M plus cumulative of one, which in our case is three plus X previous modulus of frequency S. So just writing down the operation, not doing anything, anything funky here. Just like literally reading, reading all our symbols, which we have formed all our notations and just plugging it back. And so this gives your X as three. So after step one, your new state is three. Uh, so step zero, step one. Okay, let's do step two now. So now the next symbol you receive is zero. So your next symbol is zero. Now you start from the previous state. So your previous state is three and your frequency is so for zero, um, let's just, for zero, I'm gonna pick the first elements here, right? And so for zero, um, yeah. So for zero, the frequency S is just three times eight plus my cumulus is zero, and then again it's three modulus three, which is zero. So this is one, this is just zero, and so this gives your updated state to be eight. 
Yeah. And then you can keep keep doing this for each symbol which is being added, right? So you are at each step you are updating the previous state based on the new symbol which is being received. Um okay. So I'm I'm working this out live for you, but <laughs> we have this worked out in the slides in the neater format if you like that. But yeah. So this is just like going through the same operations which we discussed just now, right? Like just each step. Um, and if you keep doing that, in this case, you'll get 101, let's say, as the final state which is being encoded. Before we go on, we'll, we'll, we'll decode this, but let's try to see the same formula for something which we have already seen, which is uniform uh, distribution case, right? Over 0 to 10, uh, 0 to 9. Um, can someone work it out and tell me what, what it gives? Hmm. Okay. Uh, I almost want to leave it as a homework. It's it's straightforward putting down the numbers. Actually, I'll I'll do so. So you can like just work it out uh, once you go home. This will actually lead back to the exact thing which we have been seeing so far. This will lead down to x previous times 10 plus s. So this is and that basically would happen because okay, I'm giving away the answer. This will always be zero. This will be S and this by frequency S doesn't matter. So it's just multiplying by M. So I know this is fast. Just work it out. It's like very basic divisions. Okay. So whatever this beast looking thing we came up with, uh, actually in the simpler case leads to the exact same thing, which where we started our lecture from, right? Okay, so, so far so good, but now we also have to figure out how to decode it uniquely, right? Like I haven't really told you how do we decode it. And before we start with that, let's have, have some observation. So this is, this is our base encode step. Again, something multiplied with M, which was like 10 plus some other term, right? So let me just write it like that. I'm going to call it the first term block ID and the second term slot. And so your block ID is just X previous modulo, uh, sorry, not modulo, integer division frequency S. So just this term, that's your block ID. And everything else is slot. This is called slot. So these are just technical term. You don't have to worry, but this is a slot. And so one way to think about what we just wrote, like the actual ANS formula is writing your state update as block ID times M plus slot, which is very similar format of what we had previously. But let's, let's talk about the slot. What can you say, say about the slot? Excellent. So the suggestion I got was, so if you look at the slot, right? So slot is just cumulus plus X previous mod of frequency S, right? And so this term, since it's a modulus operation is always going to be less than frequency S, right? And cumulus, uh, also it's always going to be greater than zero. So actually we got a nice, nice tight little bound, which is, sorry, it's always going to be less than frequency S and this term will always also be greater than zero because it's a modulus operation. Correct. So what we got was, what we got right now is slot is always less than actually cumulus plus frequency. I can just write it as cumulative of the next symbol because that's the definition of the cumulative and it's always greater than the cumulative of S. Yeah. Actually, there is an even loser bound here, which you can follow, which is your cumul, the cumulative probabilities will always be less than M. 
right? And the maximum value of the cumulative will always be less than the total sum of frequencies which you have because it's always going to miss the last symbol and it's always going to be greater than equals to zero because your cumulative probability is just sum of positive numbers. So these are strictly weaker than the one uh, which we worked out before. But now does this give you a hint? So now what we have gotten to combining point one and point two is that your X is block ID times M plus slot where slot we know is always going to be between zero and M. So does this give a hint of what we can do next? How can we retrieve the slot versus block ID? Exactly. So we'll divide by M. And so, uh, your slot. So, okay. So again, like all of these are worked out in the slide, like whatever we are working together in the class. So your slot is between zero and M, right? Uh, that basically tells that I can actually during the, um, base decode step, which we now have to work out, I can actually recover the block ID and slot by just taking the uh, modular operation and the integer part of division, right? And the only thing here we used during decoding was the fact that, oh, my slot is always between zero and M and my encoding step was block ID times M plus slot. But okay, we still haven't recovered a symbol or the previous state. We just recovered slot, uh, which was this, this whole big term, right? Like cumulative of something plus, uh, state div modulo operation with some frequency. So any idea once I know the block ID. So now I know the block ID and I know the slot. How can I maybe recover the symbol out of it? So I know the value of my slot, which is also equals to cumulative of S plus this whole thing, X previous modulo frequency S. Here is a hint. We actually, we actually know something more about slot. Right? Slot is not only greater than equals to zero, less than M, but actually it's always greater than equals to cumulative of S. Sorry, let me just rewrite this. And less than equals to cumulative, of, oh sorry, less than strictly of cumulative of S plus one. Right. We just, we just worked out a tighter bound. Does this give you a hint on how you can find the, uh, S? Again, like none, none of these questions are hard. Feel free to throw out whatever the first thing comes, comes in your mind. Like it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyone wants to build up on that answer? For the first S such that, uh, what the last S such that cumulative S is less than equal to slot. Cumulative S is exactly. So basically, the the point is your cumulus is basically an, a monotonically increasing array. So what I'm showing here is, let's say this is, uh, actually, no, this is wrong. I need to start from zero. Okay. So your cumulus, right? So this is, let's say, symbol zero, symbol one, symbol two. At each point, whenever you encounter that symbol, you are adding the frequency of that symbol, right? Uh, and so once you know that, I don't know, slot 
basically is a number which is always between cumul of something all you need to find is the band in which the slot lies really right so we know that this is an increasing function all you need to do is like find find me the s such that your slot is actually greater than the cumulative of that guy and less than the cumulative of next one and cumulative actually is a sorted array so this is where your computer search computer science search information would also come into play you can you can do this very efficiently but basically the the step which you use is so again you use this hint that your cumul is between this and all you can do is do a binary search right all you need to do is like do a left bias binary search to find the find the symbol s which is such that cumul s is just less than the slot and then cumul s plus 1 is greater than that slot and because of this exact property which we worked out this is going to be unique there is only going to be one symbol which is going to return that are people with me all right so are we done so now we know how to decode the symbol uh should we call it a day we need to know the previous state right like as we know this is a symbol by symbol operation we recovered our s but we also need to uniquely determine what our previous state was any ideas so now by this point by step 2 we know what our s is oh, sorry yeah. we know what our s is we know the block id which is x previous integer division of frequency s and we also know our slot just cumulative of s plus this uh, i'm not going to rewrite this but you know the modulus term <laughs> this point so can can we work out the x previous or do we need to do something more Mm-hmm. Exactly. I'm not gonna repeat. I'm gonna actually. This is where I'm just gonna give you the answer. It's basically direct manipulation of terms at this point. Uh, all you need to do is rearrange your original term, right? So remember, your encoding was. x equals to x previous by frequency s plus cumulus plus x previous mod frequency s right you know this term you know this term because you have figured out the symbol s so you know exactly what cumul s is so at this point you know the value of x previous modulus frequency s and you know the value of x previous integer division of frequency s so you can just rearrange the terms to figure out what your x previous was and this is what it turns out to be so just at this point you are just rearranging the term and using the fact that oh you know the s you know the exact value of cumulus and you are just using the initial equation to get back x previous So great. Uh, so ideally, this should like while we were working it out, it seems that it should work out, right? Like in the sense, like we should just the we 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 are just reversing the steps, very similar to how we were doing in the symmetric numeral systems. We are just reversing the steps and recovering symbols in opposite order and recovering the state, right? But let's let's work out an example together, just so that. Uh, i feel confident that you guys understand even though it's just redoing the same maths operation um personally i feel just redoing these algorithms by hand give give me a lot of intuitions on like what's what's happening even for maybe simpler examples 
Uh, so yeah, I, I, I encourage um, you guys to do that. So remember, like in our, in our previous case, we worked out the X final was this, uh, corresponding to some bit array. So it's like the same running example we are working with where I have three symbols, A, B, C, uh, with probability three by eight, three by eight, and two by eight, and the cumulative frequencies for them is zero, three, six. Okay. And your X final is 101. So let's, let's try to work it out. Let's just do maybe one step together and then I'll encourage you guys to go home and do the rest of them. Okay. So step one. So X final is 101. So again, we'll just repeat the steps here. Step one, step two, step three, like the three steps we worked out together, right? Okay. So step one is getting the block ID and slot. So your block ID and slot would just be uh, division by eight, right? Because my M is eight. And let's see, so uh, can somebody check that your block ID would be 12 and slot will be five? 96. Yeah, seems about right. Okay. <laughs> so this is step one. Now step two says find the symbol S such that my slot is in between the cumul of the previous one and the next one, right? So our cumul S error is this, five belongs in between three and six. And so my symbol would be this guy, right? The second one. So my symbol is one, okay? And that also means my cumul S in this case is just three which is just the cumulative probability of one. And then the step three is just working out this math. So let's just do it. X previous is block ID, which is 12 times frequency of S three plus slot, what's our slot five minus cumulus three. So this gives 38. Huh? So the algorithm outputs so let me maybe write it. Right. So you return the symbol and previous state. So your symbol return would be symbol is one and your previous state is 38. Right. So now let's just, uh, okay. We, we, we can continue doing this and I encourage you guys to go home and continue doing this. Uh, but just as a reminder, uh, let's see where we did the encoding. Okay. okay, so this is where we did the encoding, right? We just worked out the first step going back from 101 and the symbol we outputted was one and the previous state we outputted was 38. Okay. So you see, it's like the exact backtracking. So the basic idea is as you keep adding symbols, your state is increasing. And when you start decoding, you start decreasing your state and outputting, outputting back the same symbol at each point. This was like one, zero, oh, sorry. One, zero, two, one. And then while out coming back, you will just output them in reverse order. Okay. So here I just did only one step, but please go home, work out this example and ideally you should be able to recover all the previous steps. Any questions? So asymmetric was not for that. It was because of numeral systems, right? So symmetric numeral system is no matter what, what point you get, you're multiplying it by 10. In our case, the thing which you are multiplying the previous state uh, with is very different, right? It depends on the symbol which is coming in. So if you were encoding zero to 10 with very different probabilities, we'll be multiplying each number by a very different amount. So that's kind of the asymmetricity part of it. But actually, you need, you, 
this is a very important point which you brought out. You need to ensure that as you are going forward and backward, you reproduce the exact same state because that's the real point which is ensuring the losslessness. Okay, and so this is just, uh, I've already opened it. This is just a link. So, um, Kedar, whose name we hear a lot because he co-designed the course with us at past, uh, he had written this blog post on ANS and this is just an interactive. So if you just want to play with, play with some simple counts and put string, see how the state kind of expands. You can, you can just go and play with this kind of thing. So I guess in our case, it was. Oh, I forgot one second. Let's just check it. Um, mm -hmm. Zero one zero two. Can somebody remind me quickly? What's the input string? Oh yeah, one zero two one. Thanks. So let's just put in one zero two one. Comma zero, comma two, comma one and try it and you see like we recover the states which we were seeing and you can play with different symbols different frequency length would I encourage you guys to still work by hand so that but you can use this code snippet interactive to see if you are working out things right or not and then when you decode it you start with some state so in our case um well is this not opening up hmm interesting for some reason it's not allowing me to edit it but okay the point is you can you can change the state here uh, i think it's i'm on ipad so it's not allowing me and you can input the number of encoded symbols and again like the output which you'll start getting is the states in reverse order and bits thrown out in reverse order yeah so this is just a tool which uh, you guys can play with uh, the link is in the slides Hmm. Let's see. Okay. So this is now just combination of everything which we have learned so far. So just to summarize it one last time, the encoder works like this. So you start with some initial state for each symbol in the data input. You run some base encode step, which takes in state and symbol and gives you updated state. Okay. And then the final output of the encoder is this two binary. Uh, which just converts it into a binary and the base encode step does this block ID times M plus slot. All right. And then this is like the combined decoder. And so at this point, this is called range ANS uh, encoder and decoder. These are the operations. So during decoding, you just do the exact inverse, right? So you convert bits to final state first. Um, then for the range in symbols, you run the base encode step. Your base encode step has to return the symbol and the previous state. And we just talked about how we can recover that. And finally, you need to return the reverse. This is, this is important. You are always decoding in the reverse order. All right. So now if you, if you think about like, so how we motivated RANS, right? Like the first question, which I asked you when we move from symmetric numeral systems, to asymmetric numeral systems is what's happening with the state, right? So again, with same argument, your state now um, is increasing by approximately one over probability of your symbol s as your states keep increasing. And so the final state can be represented using the approximately log two of x final bits. Correct? Uh, and so the question for you guys is, what's the approximate encode length for an input SN? So now suppose you have a stream of symbols, S1, S2, SN, which was like 1, 0, 2, 1 before. Uh, what's like the encode length approximately?
is the expected value of one to one over the S, which is just energy. Exactly, right? So now, basically for each symbol, as you were encoding SN, even without block lens, so as to say involved, like we were seeing in Huffman code, you are basically multiplying it. Let me write it with this. Yeah, You are multiplying first symbol. When first symbol comes, you are multiplying X by 1 by PS1. Second symbol comes, you are multiplying it by PS2, roughly given S1, so on and so forth. And so finally, like, the rough length which you get, which you will get is you are multiplying the whole symbol by one over probability of the n tuple of whatever that symbol is. And so your length is just log inverse of this. And again, tying back to a thumb rule, this basically tells us, oh, we have suddenly found a very good <laughs> encoder decoder because it gives you something very close to entropy. And so we are, we are not talking about like, so this is all a very hand wavy argument, I know, but this is more like, I guess, in the spirit of the course, uh, for those of you who are like mathematically, um, enthusiastic about how to get like very formal bounds for ANS, uh, like we have been doing for arithmetic coding, where we saw that there was a two bit overhead over whatever the block length of your symbol was, or in the case of Huffman, where it was one, um, we can discuss it offline, but it's it's not it's not trivial to analyze. What I really want you guys to take away from this whole discussion is that intuitively it makes sense that this compressor is somewhat optimal. It can give you good compression rates, like arithmetic coding was giving. This was roughly the hand wavy argument, even in the case of arithmetic coding, right? Okay. And something very interesting actually, which will, which just to connect it to what you guys will see in future is, so I think when I first saw it, uh, for most of the people I know, when they first saw RANS, they had probably the same reaction as some of you, like, where did that equation come from? Like, why does that cumulus plus mod, blah, blah. And then you somehow beautifully come up with decoding mechanism where everything works out. You just had those somehow some bonds, which, uh, kind of, uh, solve everything right in, in, in this discussion, we went over, I continuously gave you hints, but now imagine you just somehow surprisingly came up with that one day, uh, to a, to a friend and say, this works. <laughs> And historically, that's somewhat how it happened. <laughs> Somebody, uh, Yarek Duda actually, who's, who's amazing. He came up with this approach and it took people a lot of time to really understand like what's really happening. Uh, but one actually very cute, I would say, way to connect back to what's really happening is this idea of bits back coding. Um, and we'll not discuss it right now. It's just something I want you guys to kind of, uh, just know about. Uh, so this is like another way to think about RANS. So we took one approach, but you could have taken a completely different approach and would have basically landed at very similar looking equations. Uh, and it basically has connection with this joint entropy formula. So if you were to compress X, ideally, one way to think about this joint entropy formula. So this is for any other random variable Z. This is just an identity. This is, this is a mathematical fact. You can think of encoding and decoding X as like doing something with joint distribution of X and Z and then doing something with the conditional distribution of Z and X. Okay. And I know it's not making sense right now, but basically this minus sign, right? So you can encode a symbol X using some encoder decoder pair one and some encoder decoder pair pair two, where you have some minus sign, which we haven't really dealt with, right? Like everywhere we have been dealing with positive lens, positive everything. This kind of gives the name bits back. Just like you are, you'll encode something, but then you'll also give some bits back to remain like close to very ideal thing. And it's always might sound mysterious, but go check out homework to Q4, uh, hopefully soon, soon, uh, less than 24 hours. You should be able to see it, work it out. Um, and then for those of you who were a bit may, may, may didn't appreciate the fact, like what, what does it mean to have a conditional entropy, 
deeply. <laughs> well, like next few lectures, as Shubham might think pointed out, even in the next class, it's going to be like now we are going to be talking about conditional entropy, conditional probability distributions, because we'll stop uh, assuming independence. So basically, next few lectures and working through homework will really make you understand whatever we did today from another light independently. And okay, so at this point, I want to go into some uh, some qualitative aspects instead of uh, instead of everything. So some properties of RNS, like now, where does RNS stand, right, with respect to arithmetic coding? So first of all, we understood that the performance is optimal and actually very similar to arithmetic coding. Goes back to our rule of thumb, which we just talked about. Uh, we are actually doing reverse decoding. Um, this can be a lot of problem for streaming algorithms, if you think about it. That's why I've been highlighting like reverse decoding, reverse decoding, right? Because it's 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 no more uh, like the encoding is in streaming fashion, let's say, but decoding now will give you symbols in opposite direction, which might not be good if a low latency or a high throughput uh, encoder decoder pair is your demand. But but you can see again work, there are schemes to work around it. Um, and it actually has simpler encoding and decoding. So this is something which we didn't really talk about. Uh, but uh, Shubham mentioned last class, like arithmetic coding uh, is amazing, but it has these floating point operations involved everywhere. Whereas uh, in our in our encoder, I'm just going back to our RNS encoder. Actually, you have some operations which can be done very efficiently. So for example, even though you have uh, integer division, you can pre-compute one over frequency s. Yes. So you don't like this is just like this can be cached and done once. Similarly, like you can just be intelligent about the choice of m. So if m is a power of two, multiplying by it is just a left shift which can be done extremely efficiently in hardware. So basically choosing engineering choices gives you a lot of efficiency in terms of how RANS can be implemented and is the reason why it has fast encoding, decoding faster. Okay, but there is actually one issue which we still haven't solved. So RNS sounds great, like any guesses practically what might be one of the issues? Yeah, so that's that's probably a comment which is coming after attempting homework one. <laughs> yes, you do have to find M, which is which which works well. But I I would say that isn't that isn't fundamental issue. Can can be worked out. Take M large enough for like probabilities are never exact. Let's say for whatever precision you are working with, maybe it's okay. But there's actually the fundamental issue. So if you look at like the input symbol string as it keeps growing, your state just never stops increasing, right? Like you're always increasing your state. You're always multiplying it with something. And so no matter what you do, after a few symbols, when I say few, maybe around 20 to 40, you'll already reach a state which will start overflowing, no matter what you do. And this is like, I would say this has a parallel to, um, okay. Yeah, so this has a parallel to what uh, we learned in arithmetic coding also, right? Like, so as you keep multiplying probability, your intervals keep becoming small and small. And a lot of practical compressor goes into a lot of depth into solving these issues because these are very important and practical issues. Um, and so, yeah, basically after 30, 40 symbols, you'll, you'll go above. Okay, so one solution to avoid this is like, you can restrict the x to be an interval l comma h. One thing which you don't wouldn't want to do is like restart, right? You wouldn't want to be like, okay, whenever it overflows, I reset my state and I start from the beginning because that's losing all the advantage. It's losing the block advantage. It's losing the fact that states need to be high enough to actually get you a compression ratio near the log probability, right? Log one over probability. And so one way to solve this is, so we'll not um, think, uh, I don't want to get into the details given the time, but basically now you will, you will try to keep the state 
in between this interval l comma h and one way to do this is when you do the encode step your first step is like even your base encode step always assumes the state which you are getting is in between l and h so before actually calling this step you need to call a shrink state step which takes some x and returns an returns the state x shrunk which is in between some predefined window l comma h but obviously this step will be lossy if you don't actually give out some bits with it right like because you are changing the state you are just dividing it and putting it to some other thing you are losing some information so this step also gives out some bits and yeah let's not go into the details let me just show you like how this kind of function looks like so if you start with x previous something like 22 or 1011b uh one way to get this shrink state is to always divide this by 2 and output the last bit so for example if you start with 10110 at first step you can do 1011 and then you can out the last bit 0 next step you can output 1 you can take out 1 and add it to the list of out bits and keep it to 101 and you keep doing this till your state basically comes in the interval l comma h yeah. and this is basically your string state function which is while your base encode step is not in this interval you just maintain an out bits which is just modulo base 2 and you keep shrinking your original range okay so what it's doing is that at each step i might output some bits i'm not really waiting to encode the whole state towards the end and at that point i output some bit that's really the key difference and then a really important question to think about is how many bits do you have to stream out right what is this l comma h uh, and in practice like you need to ensure two things right whenever you are shrinking this state uh you need to ensure that there is uniqueness involved there is only one there is one first of all and only one symbol which is going to lie given no matter what state you started with to get it in between this l comma h window huh? and don't worry about it that basically gives you some bound about what your l comma h can be and this was like what was chosen in the original paper of ans and choosing something like this satisfies this condition and i'm 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 not going to cover it in class i think in the interest of time i don't want to go over uh but all of these are also present in the notes so i would encourage you guys to read the notes to understand like the basic idea which we just discussed huh? but but you might imagine one thing which i'll say since we have almost discussed the idea like so come on mm-hmm. okay so the full decoder now so will involve some expanding of state right because right now you are shrinking some state so when you are decoding you need to somehow expand that state to get back the original thing and that will use the out bits which were involved so you will have some x shrunk some encoded bit array and a reverse operation of whatever we saw right and so your decode step would it's it's going to be exact opposite same spirit so your first step would be base decode step um which will give you some state and shrunk state and then you'll expand that state which is going to do a reverse operation and combining these two basically gives you a full streaming encoder and uh, decoder okay this is like the complete complete thing a uh, couple of things which happens in practice again is like you'll take m to be power of 2 you'll choose t to be as large as possible when streaming out this bits you might not want to do a single bit at a time but bytes at a time okay and we have the so in scl we have the rns implemented and again like uh, like all the previous lectures i would encourage you guys to like go over the code 
see if you understand it. Um, yeah, and we didn't we didn't really go over TNS in this lecture, but that's that's really like the the basic idea in TNS is how can we speed this up? So the name of TNS is table ANS, right? And so the question really is, what else can we cache? How can we really speed this RNS up? Uh, any ideas given homework one, what we have seen so far? How do you, like, what do you cache? How do you cache things? Like one, one recurring thing, theme, which is, uh, which we have seen maybe even in tree based quotes is, Trees are slow because you have to take decisions, right? And so whenever you have to speed up something, you might want to come up with some lookup tables. That's like a very, very good <laughs> rule of thumb in, uh, when you're coding. If you can come up with some lookup tables, you can really speed up your code. And that's basically the idea of uh, like caching RANS and TNS. And it kind of relies on the fact that like uh, in our RANS base encode step, when you go from this state symbol to a new state, you are always maintaining it between the same lower and higher window. So you can basically pre-compute given whatever your previous state is going to be, whatever new alphabet is going to be, what your new state ever can be. And so you actually never even have to compute that. And that's called TANS, and it basically takes some hit um, in terms of performance. But the key idea really is that like lookup tables are really fast, so use them for for speed trade-offs. And so, kind of this is this is the last slide, but this was also the first slide where we started from. So again, combining like all the ideas which we learned. So I hope now you guys understand exactly how RANS works. TANS, we didn't go in details, but like we have some notes. You are welcome to uh, go through the notes. You are welcome to go through the code in SCL and come talk to us if you want to understand that better. Uh, variants of RANS and TANS could also be interesting uh, project proposals and ideas to be implemented for practical compressors. Um, these have really replaced arithmetic and Huffman coding in almost uh, many new modern compressors which have come out and the things to again notice is that like the compression performance of RANS is very similar to TANS and that's because of that rule of thumb which we have been looking into and which we were able to achieve with RANS. TANS takes some, some hit because we cache and we don't do exact operations but on the other hand if you look at speed TNS has speeds which are very, like at least decode speeds which are very close to Huffman and then encode which is competitive at the very least. Right? And yep. Yeah. Uh, this, this was, I would say the last lecture uh, in the series of where we, we started, like if we look back, we started this class with like very simple examples, IID. Uh, we worked out how you can encode them to how you can encode them optimally, uh, like how you can encode them losslessly to how you can encode them optimally losslessly. And then we learned various different practical lossless codecs, really like uh, various different approaches. Huffman coding, Shannon coding, Huffman, um, sorry, and I repeated that, arithmetic coding, ANS, right? But so far we have, we really had a strong assumption, like we are talking about entropy uh, but everywhere we assume that the symbols were IID. Uh, but in real life, like you can have symbols which are highly correlated. The next symbol might not be independent of the previous one, right? Take, take anything, take language, right? Like the uh, symbols are highly correlated. Um, and the next few lectures will go into the details of how do you actually work with real data which you see? How do you deal with this correlation uh, while ensuring lossless compression performance? And how do you do it adaptively? How do you like, okay, some teaser trailer, how do you use things like LLMs uh, to to get your state-of-the-art compressor? Uh, so yeah, so I think we're gonna change the direction a little bit, but whatever we have been studying is gonna keep building on that. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>